Um, I think it's really important that there's more collaboration also between the HOH and Nissan, and actually we're already uh, trying to improve it uh, right now. We have our weekly meet and meetings with the uh, nephrologists. Let me just uh, uh, give you a short overview of infections on Aruba. And I'm actually not really sure, um, I was not really sure what to um, discuss with you guys. So I just want to start actually uh, quite basic. You can have a second slide, please. So this is basically the, the overview of my, uh, of my talk. So first, in, I want to uh, just talk in general about our bacteria. I uh, emphasize the hour because basically what, uh, what we know right now is that uh, our body consists of a huge uh, microbiome. Um, and there's even more uh, bacterial cells um, in or around our body than we have human cells. Uh, so um, we're not really sure how many, but um, estimates guess that uh, somewhere between um, we have like between two to 10 times as much uh, bacterial cells in or around our body uh, than human cells. So we have to be very careful what to, uh, what to do with it. And also every time we give antibiotic, it's like an attack on these bacterial cells, on, on these bacterial friends that, uh, that we have. Um, then I want to uh, shortly discuss uh, antibiotics in, on Aruba and especially the availability because we get a lot of questions, well, I think also the pharmacists, a lot of questions, um, uh, certain antibiotics uh, that are not available, uh, for example. And actually, the situation in Aruba is quite good, as I'll show you later. Um, I want to discuss the antibiotic booklet that uh, me and my colleagues uh, developed uh, last, uh, last year. Actually, there's three internists that are also an infectious disease specialist uh, in the HAOHA. So it's Jacqueline de Court, uh, Bert Rodenberg, and, uh, and me. And we together make, made our local antibiotic booklet, and it's um, specifically not only for the HOH or the IMSAM, but it's also for the, um, for the general practitioners, uh, basically for every healthcare worker uh, on Aruba Bay. And uh, I want just to um, go with you through a few common infections and just give you also some uh, thoughts of how we uh, come to a certain recommendation in case of uh, antibiotics. Um, so, so basically we go to the urinary tract infection, cellulitis, sepsis, uh, especially for the uh, ER doctors from IMSAM. Uh, hopefully there's some discussion after it as well. And I also briefly want to mention the so-called penicillin or beta-lactam uh, myth, because it's uh, mostly a myth and many people are deprived from very uh, good, uh, probably the most effective antibiotic therapy that we have. And then we hopefully still have time for discussion and uh, take home messages. So next slide, please. So this is a, this is a nice overview of um, all the bacteria that we're carrying um, and depending on the side of the body usually you can say what kind of bacteria we, uh, we carry like for example for the skin and um, most of the skin um, uh, bacteria that are uh, just living on our skin on everybody's skin are um, uh, staph epidermis or the so-called cns <coughs> it's the group of cns and that's usually a very innocent uh, pathogen it hardly gives any infections except in people that have kidney valley catheters or, uh, for example, dialysis uh, uh, catheters uh, uh, or like uh, artificial uh, bulbs in the heart. But there's also, for example, the staph aureus. Uh, that one is, of course, a very well-known pathogen. But it can be like in about 30% of the people, staph aureus is being found on the skin. And hardly anybody, uh, there's only a few people that, that will get sick of it. Um, if we look to, for example, the throat, we find more uh, streptococci, for example. Um, if we look to the nose, usually you find uh, the, uh, the skin flora, but it's also a very important um, uh, niche, I would say, for staph aureus. Also people that are Marseille carriers, which is a staph aureus 
that is a beta lactam resistant. Uh, usually we try to eradicate it from the nose as well. And then if you go basically <coughs> below the diaphragm, uh, you find uh, all kinds of uh, gram negative bacteria. So they do they have a different, they have a completely different cell wall than the gram positives. Um, and anaerobic bacteria, those are bacteria that only actually can live in places with a very low oxygen uh, content. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is just the slide to show also that um, actually no part of your body is free of bacteria, and it shouldn't be free of bacteria because we need all, we need most of these bacteria. If you look to, for example, if, if we go from up to down, now we start in the, the mouth or the esophagus, uh, there are already uh, lactobacilli in a very low concentration, but you can never say that uh, any side of the bacteria is, uh, is sterile. Even in the stomach, where, which has an acidity of uh, a pH of two in general, there's only a few bacteria that can survive. Uh, like there are some lactobacilli and um, uh, an important pathogen, a bacteria that can survive, probably everybody has heard of it, but it's the Bacterium, uh, which is a very special bacteria that can survive inside the, the stomach in, in some people. If you go down, then usually the amount of bacteria increases uh, extremely rapidly uh, and if you go down to the last bowel actually that is full that there's basically billions of bacteria and we need these bacteria and uh, uh, we need them to ferment uh, 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 our food to uh, to make to help make uh, vitamin k for example a uh, very important vitamin to uh, regulate our uh, uh, blood coagulation for example so without these bacteria, we couldn't even live. Um, it's a very high amount. Huh? And just remember, we have up to 10 times more bacterial cells in, our, in or on our body than we have human uh, cells. So every time that you give antibiotics, you're killing all your friends uh, on your skin, in your bowel. Uh, you're changing the flora in the, in the bowel. Um, the whole set of... Um, of bacteria is actually called the microbioma. And the last 10, 15 years, there has been a huge amount of, uh, uh, of studies um, to look for the relation between the subset uh, of the bacteria and the microbioma uh, and the, the amount of disease. Um, we know, for example, that um, in a patient with Crohn's disease, uh, like uh, uh, the granulomatous disease of the colon, that the microbiome is completely different than people that don't have Crohn's. Right? And no one really knows actually if it's uh, a result of the Crohn or if it's causing the Crohn as well. And there are more and more signs and, and that point to also that if you have a bacterial imbalance, you are more likely to, uh, to develop um, Crohn's disease and other inflammatory bowel uh, diseases. Can I have the next one, please? Um, yeah, this is just a general overview with uh, antibiotics, and, and I, I mentioned again actually that antibiotics is probably from from medicine. It's one of our big uh, victories eh? um, because of antibiotics. Uh, people live in average uh, uh, 15 to 20 years uh, longer than 100 years ago. Uh, with it's it's amazing that uh, sometimes just with a few amount of pills that hardly have any side effects that we can uh, cure potentially lethal uh, diseases. It basically started with the development of uh, sulfonamides eh, in the, just before uh, World War II, uh, and then the first uh, penicillin was uh, discovered. It's uh, yeah, penicillin itself by uh, Fleming, eh, and actually he discovered it uh, uh, on a plate where it's uh, full of stuff aureus, and at that time, uh, uh, Staph aureus was uh, almost universally susceptible to, uh, 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 to penicillin. Right now, actually, 90% of uh, Staph aureus is penicillin uh, resistant. Um, basically, this uh, just continues for the whole time because beta lactam discovered at that time 
but um, in the 1940s we have simple penicillins, then in the 60s we, we got methicillin, or flucroxacillin, or oxacillin, oxacillin, floxacillin, and, and flucrox is basically the same, but uh, this the floxacillin is an extra chloride um, uh, atom, and the flucrox is an extra fluor. Uh, uh, atom just to uh, increase the half-life and just to increase the absorption, but the mechanism is all the same. So methicillin was actually in this uh, this uh, time in the 60s developed, uh, and uh, augmentin, for example, and so bevelactamase bevelactamase inhibitors was developed in the uh, like the end 70s, the beginning of the 80s. Bevelactamase. I want to stress it also is probably our best group of antibiotics, and I will show you why later. But most other antibiotic groups, they are not um, able to kill as efficiently uh, as, as efficiently as the beta-lactams. <coughs> then we got the tetracyclines, doxycycline, tetracycline itself, for example, chromatidicol. We got uh, it's not being used that much anymore because you can give like. Aminoglycosides, uh, uh, we basically just use it um, inside hospitals, for example, uh, gentamicin, uh, for example, amikacin, uh, for example, in more hospital. It's, it's also a hospital uh, antibiotic because it can only, only be given in IV. Uh, the macrolides, azithromycin, is actually, I always call it the Philippine. Uh, antibiotic because it's been, been discovered in the jungle in the Philippines. Um, then the glycopeptides, pancomycin, a very important one, kinolomus, uh, this group is not that important. And uh, in, the, in the 2000s we got uh, a few new ones like Venusri. Actually, after this 2000, uh, the process is being restarted basically to make more antibiotics. So it stopped around no new classes were found until the 70s, then there was very little interest uh, with pharmaceutical companies to continue with it because basically everything <coughs> they treated with these classes, but then we got all these kind of resistances and then in the, uh, after 2000, things basically restarted again. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is just a sidestep, but a very important sidestep, and uh, I think for the Doctors among us, uh, I would say this is probably the most important slide that I want to show you because this is also what I'm teaching to the students because uh, inflammation is not the same as infection. And so inflammation, uh, I mean the most important sign of inflammation, systemic inflammation is probably fever uh, and the most important uh, blood value for inflammation is uh, elevated Side or CRP. CRP is actually more sensitive and more specific. But it's not the same as infection. If they say in infection markers, then I also correct them all also because there are so much more uh, uh, reasons for inflammation in the, uh, in the blood. So if someone comes in here with on the Epson ER and someone has 39, for example, don't think, okay, 39 must be an infection just give him antibiotics and uh, send him home or whatever. Uh, the things of these uh, these causes. So inflammation is not uh, nothing else than immune activation. And immune activation can be done on two ways. Well, actually it can be uh, activated by uh, pathogen associated uh, molecular pat patterns. So the immune system uh, uh, recognizes uh, foreign body and Things, hey, there's something for you. We have to uh, start killing it, uh, like the uh, lipopolysaccharide ball from uh, bacteria, for example. But also, uh, the immune system also become activated uh, by so called damage associated uh, molecular patterns, uh, cells that go in uh, necrosis. So you have apoptosis and necrosis. Uh, apoptosis is the nice way that the cell breaks down itself, and necrosis is the way that the cell gets. Killed and uh, needs the, the area needs to be cleaned up. Uh, so you always have these two things, and infection is one cause of uh, of immune activation, but there are much more causes. So if patients 
just a, like a 60 year old lady comes to the ER with uh, 38, uh, 8 for example, <coughs> huh? and a CFP of 200. I want our residents to always check for these six things. Huh? So everybody thinks about infection, uh, bacterial, viral, uh, whatever, but it can be infarction. I mean, uh, people with a, a big uh, myocardial infarction, for example, uh, they also uh, have tissue necrosis. Like um, a big myocardial infarction, you also get tissue necrosis, and of course you need the immune system to uh, activate itself and to uh, uh, basically to clean up the mess and also bleeding, for example, so uh, like an uh, intracranial bleed, for example, and people with uh, like a bleed paralysis, for example, sometimes they have also 38.5 or 38.6, and sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate, like if an old lady, 80 years old, comes in uh, with a hemiparesis, for example, she can have 38.3 uh, or so, CFP of 100, Everybody just only thinks about um, infections, actually. But think about this also. Bleeding leads to uh, ischemia in that area, to necrosis, immune activation. Your body just needs to uh, clean up the mess, also in the um, basically also in the in the head or whatever. So you need the immune system just to um, to to clean the debris. I would say uh, trauma the same. Huh? Is it still work? Yeah. Um, the trauma the same, if uh, tissue is being destructed, you need the immune system to, uh, to fix everything. Malignancy is very important. Uh, people who come and go to the ER, always, usually it's in the range of 38, 38, 5, and they have weight loss. Uh, think of malignancy, yeah? Um, uh, you can have a tumor. A tumor always has a lot of necrosis also. So the immune system is activated in, uh, in, in tumors. and. Uh, uh, if there's uh, if, if the tumor is quite big or so, then usually there's also a, a, an inflammatory induced inflammatory response. You can find it in the in the blood as well uh, by testing, for example, the CRP. And another um, cause is uh, autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So basically, this is this is how we always reason as uh, infectiologists. Uh, we, we just looked at these 10 questions. Uh, the first one is the most important one, I would say. Uh, are the symptoms really caused by uh, an infection? Is the fever caused by an, uh, by an infection? Or is it one of the five or six other uh, reasons that I just stated? Then we look for what is the most likely focus. Uh, we're always looking for uh, like a lung problem and a urinary tract uh, problem, for example. Yeah, what is the most likely pathogen? Eh? So if it's a skin infection, uh, for example, you're thinking of the star aureus of uh, streptococci. Uh, if you think of uh, a urinary tract infection, you think of an E. coli or a protease or whatever. If it's a bowel infection, you think basically of almost the same uh, uh, pathogens. Do we need a culture? Um, not always we need a culture, especially not in the first line. I mean, uh, for the because basically, uh, if someone comes with a cystitis, for example, uh, um, a young a young lady with a, a cystitis, you don't really need a culture, you can just treat it. And also in the hospital, we don't sometimes need um, uh, a culture only when patients are very sick and when you want to be 100% sure, almost 100% sure, to know that you're uh, doing, uh, uh, you're, you're good, basically. Yeah, can the infection be treated with antibiotics? Uh, if it's a virus, then uh, it doesn't help, huh? as we know. Which antibiotic and in which uh, dose? Um, in some compartments of the body, we need higher uh, <coughs> concentrations. Uh, for example, the brain, huh? you have the blood brain barrier, and the blood brain barrier is made that uh, it's like extra protection. Usually, most antibiotics only reach. 30% or 50% of their blood concentration, uh, only 30 50% of that concentration they reach uh, in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, for example. So that's why 
for example, for uh, meningitis, uh, you do need to get more of the uh, of Zafixone. You get uh, two times, like you get like four grams of Zafixone. Another uh, uh, example is like an abscess, for example, an abscess in the in the abdomen. Uh, usually, like, you just have like a bowel infection or whatever. Uh, antibiotic is easy to reach that, but an abscess, it's well, basically, it's walled off. Uh, so the bacteria tries to make a uh, like a hole where uh, antibiotics can really uh, diffuse very difficultly, and then sometimes it helps just to give uh, more of the antibiotics. Um, yeah, which antibiotic uh, and which uh, dose? And usually for severe infections, uh, we try to remain to the beta lactam antibiotic. Uh, it's still probably the best. Uh, Group that we have. Can the antibiotic be given uh, for the oral route? Uh, for some, that is possible, huh? like uh, cyproxin, for example. Huh? Cyproxin has a biological availability of 80%, huh? so that means if you give 500 milligram by mouth, about 400 milligram would be uh, taken up by the, by the body. And some other um, um, uh, antibiotics, they have almost a zero. <coughs> Bioavailability, for example, vancomycin, chantamycin, and so you have to give all these uh, antibiotics on the IV. And sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a problem, right? Because sometimes you get chantamycin, for example, for a few days, and then um, afterwards the patient is improving, and uh, you know, you want to treat them in total like 10 days or, or two weeks, for example, and uh, you don't know what to give. Uh, uh, orally, what is uh, being absorbed well by the, by the body. How to evaluate its effect? Um, well, for example, for uh, the urinary tract infection, it's quite easy. You can uh, measure the, the, uh, the leukocytes again, and you can uh, look at the patient, ask him if he or she is getting better. But for some other things, it's quite difficult to, uh, uh, to evaluate its effect. Uh, for example, like a pneumonia, material pneumonia. You can do an x-ray, you see an infiltrate in the lower row. And after one week, the patient is completely healthy. But if you do the uh, same x-ray again, you see exactly the same. I mean, it takes six weeks in general uh, for things to clear up on an x-ray. So that's why it usually it doesn't make any sense to, um, to copy uh, or to, to repeat uh, the x-ray after one week, unless people are deteriorating, uh, but then you uh, don't make an x-ray to see if it's resolved, but you make an x-ray to see if there's no empyema, if there's no other complication, no pneumothorax, for example, or lung abscess or whatever. Um, what is the total duration? Well, in the past, um, many infections were treated way too long, um, 10 days to 14 days. Uh, Every, well, most patients also get from the, the, uh, all the doctors the instructions, you have to finish the course until you feel completely uh, well. We still give that advice, but there's a lot of discussion and uh, a lot of uh, uh, infectious disease specialists now try to uh, bring the total duration back. For example, like pneumonia, it used to be treated for two weeks in total. Um, but um, sometimes three days or four days or five days is really enough. And it's harmful to give it too long because then you get more out selection. And the thing is that, uh, like for example, for pneumonia, um, the most important cause for pneumonia is, um, or the most dangerous one, is the, the pneumococcus. Uh, and the pneumococcus is extremely virulent but it's extremely susceptible to antibiotic also. So you can be extremely sick uh, with a septic shock uh, from a pneumococcus. Um, but if you can check the bacterial load after 24 hours, it has been reduced by maybe 99% or maybe even more. But the immune system is still hyperactivated and it stays activated for four days, five days, seven days sometimes. But people take the, the fever and the, the feeling that they're sick. They they think that still the uh, the bacteria is 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 giving these problems. Uh, but it's more the 
the, the overactive reaction, I would say, from the immune system that is completely derailed, I would say. Uh, and, and the pneumococcus is already for a long time dead. Uh, and uh, because we, we know that more and more that um, the derailed immune system is, uh, is getting more of a problem than the bacteria itself, uh, we can uh, shorten and shorten the length of the antibiotics. But it's difficult to explain that to the patient because the patient still has fever and he still doesn't feel well. And then you come as a doctor and you say, okay, we can stop the antibiotics we can because we're quite sure that the infection has already been, been treated. Okay, and the TET is um, the host immune uh, response is working properly. <coughs> uh, and that's a very important one because I would say most patients that we see in a hospital, they have a weakened immune system. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a dialysis patient, for example, or if it's a diabetic patient, uh, uh, for example, but diabetes gives severe neutrophil dysfunction. Um, uh, kidney insufficiency gives all kinds of uh, uh, immune system problems. So we have to keep that in mind also. So if uh, dialysis patients get a uh, uh, cellulitis, an infection of the uh, skin and soft tissue, then usually it's more severe than if, if one of us gets an, gets an infection. And that's sometimes, uh, well, that we sometimes have to uh, think about that when we give uh, anti-infective therapy as well. Do you have the next slide, please? <coughs> also, we have to look for uh, contraindications, uh, like uh, uh, age, for example. Huh? Uh, certain uh, antibiotics are uh, contraindicated in uh, children. Pregnancy, the same. You have to check for liver and kidney insufficiency yeah, because if you have kidney insufficiency and you get vancomycin, the usual dose, then within two or three days uh, you get extremely high dosages of, uh, of vancomycin. And you have to uh, think about allergies, but usually allergy is a bit overdone. I will come back to it uh, later. And you have to check for interactions and you have to check for uh, earlier antibiotic use. Uh, we also, if people come with a sepsis on the ER in the HOH, we're thinking about earlier antibiotic use because then the risk, of course, for out selection is bigger and we uh, give uh, sometimes two or three antibiotics instead of one. And the next one, please. Just to touch around on the way of antibiotics work, well, actually, I don't want you to remember too much about it, but uh, basically, all kinds of classes work on a different way. Um, but once again, the, the beta lactams, uh, our best class, I would say, work on the uh, cell wall, uh, wall of the and basis. And they actually uh, attack the bacteria when the, uh, the bacteria divides. And so uh, when one bacteria becomes two, uh, basically they just split off here. For a short time, the wall, of course, when you cut it, the wall is gone, and then the wall is being remade. Eh? And in that time that the, the, uh, the wall of the bacteria is made, then the red beta lactam uh, takes its, uh, its chance and uh, uh, makes sure that the wall cannot be made, and then the bacteria starts leaking and the bacteria dies. So that's important to know that uh, beta lactams only work on uh, dividing or multiplicating bacteria. So if bacteria don't multiplicate, then beta lactams also don't work. Uh, that is quite important for certain bacteria that uh, don't divide rapidly. Uh, does anyone know, like a standard bacteria, like a staph aureus, how, uh, how long it takes until they divide? 20 minutes. Yeah, like uh, minutes, okay, yeah. About 20 minutes, eh? 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes, the beta lactam has a, a, a chance basically to kill the bacteria. Um, tuberculosis, for example, has a, a dividing time of 20 Weeks. hours. Mm -hmm. So basically only once every 20 hours, there is a window of opportunity for beta lactam to, to, to kill the bacteria. Um, so, you can understand that for tuberculosis, for example, <coughs> the cell wall uh, agents are not so good as the ones that 
uh, inhabits uh, proteins, for example, necessary proteins in the bacteria, or the DNA uh, repair uh, uh, process. Very slowly dividing is uh, the Cephalus bacteria. And we still treat the Cephalus bacteria with penicillin, right? Penidural. So what is the reason that penidural still works? For uh, even though it's a beta lactam. Can anyone think about that? Sensitive. Yeah, it's it's very sensitive. But the problem is that uh, the beta lactam can only attack the cephalus once every 20 hours, basically. So it's not. Yeah. Well, the thing is that you have to, it. It doesn't work to give like augmentin or broxil or penicillin or fluoxetine. And you have to give something that works for uh, a long time that eats that gives uh, uh, concentrations of penicillin uh, very long um, for weeks for example and then we know what to give because penidural is actually an injection of penicillin uh, and it, it's uh, instead of like uh, i mean if you would give like tablets of penicillin it will be like if you get concentrations like this after some hours then down to zero this down this but if you get penidural, you just have a steady state of a low concentration in the blood of penicillin. And uh, because uh, the syphilis bacteria is very susceptible to penicillin, uh, if it divides at the moment, there is the penicillin in the blood that basically you kill it. But that's the reason why you have to give penidural to syphilis. And uh, augmentin or so doesn't really uh, help. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is, uh, I don't want you to remember this, but this is uh, the, the, the set of the tools of antibiotics basically that, uh, that we use in the, in the hospital as well. And you see that, uh, uh, well, basically every time you uh, find an infection or you're thinking of some infection, you have to make a choice between all these, uh, uh, these antibiotics. Uh, these are all the, uh, the penicillins. Uh, uh, thinking is the penicillin itself is the smallest. It usually only comes for uh, uh, pneumonia with a uh, pneumococcus or a group A streptococcal infection and the streptococcus pyogenes, the meat eating bacteria. Penicillin is very good. Clubrox uh, also takes the gram negatives. Uh, and uh, peptazo is even broader and it takes the, the pseudomonas as well. So this is our most important uh, toolbox, I would say. Then we have the cephalosporins. It's more used in the hospital. Huh? And the rule of thumb for the cephalosporins is that the more, the higher the generation, the more negative they, uh, they become. So cephalosporins we use a lot uh, also for dialysis patients, uh, for example. The, uh, the trick about that is that if a dialysis patient has a, has a severe staphylococcus infection, they only need to have two grams of cephalosporin every uh, after every dialysis, and because it's uh, it stays in the body, uh, it's not being cleared because the kidney function is so bad. Uh, you can just uh, treat them. Uh, you just do the dialysis. You just uh, treat them afterwards with two grams of cephalosporin, and then it stays in the body until the next uh, dialysis session. So you don't have to keep them in the hospital. You just uh, every time they come to the dialysis, you give them cephalosporin. Cephaloxim is second generation already, a bit more gram negative spectrum, and uh, the third generation. This is the one that is used more for sepsis, and you already see why. Because it's quite, it takes this, um, to, the more, to the higher generation, you have ceftazidine, which is very good for pseudomonas, but ceftazidine starts to lose its gram positive, its streptococcus and stuff aureus, um, uh, how do you say, coverage. So, you cannot treat a staph aureus infection with cephalosidine. Actually, there's a fourth generation that's being used, for example, in Colombia a lot, it's uh, CVP, and that uh, covers the same as this with uh, staph aureus uh, as well. We, we are actually thinking of taking CVP in the, in the hospital uh, as well. Um, then we have Meropenam, it's probably the widest uh, that we have, but it's also the, the, the backup or the reserve antibiotic. And we are really careful to use it 
uh, because if you use it too much, uh, you get uh, uh, like uh, resistance, uh, cover up in the maze, uh, resistance here, for example. Uh, and we want to uh, keep it as low as possible, of course. So usually we have only like one to three patients with uh, uh, with Mayo Panac in the hospital. Only we only use it if, if uh, uh, we really have no other option. But yeah, vancomycin is only a positive. Cypro, which is in general being overused everywhere around the world, Vindamycin and Gantafrican. Can I have the, the next slide, please? Okay, um, now I worked in St. Martin before, so I know a little bit about the, some other islands. I also know the, uh, the infectiologist uh, from Curacao quite well, so I can tell you a bit reliably about the use of, uh, the, about the supply of antibiotics, and actually that's quite good on uh, Aruba, I would say. Uh, for example, in, in Curaçao, they have constant stock outs. They have times, weeks, that they don't have any near uh, in the hospital, for example, which is, of course, very bad uh, if you're in need of it. Um, and, for example, in Colombia, um, it's also a bit varying supply. Uh, the Hospital Internacional in Bucamanga, we have quite good relations with them, but sometimes they ask our hospital pharmacist, uh, Adi Ruiz, for the some of you uh, may know him for uh, uh, certain antibiotics uh, because, uh, well, Aruba is quite well stocked uh, in general. So uh, sometimes I hear from patients, yeah, I don't have that. We don't have the antibiotics that we have in Venezuela or whatever. I don't think it's it's really that uh, that correct. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, guidelines. Uh, so last year when we made the booklet, um, we took actually the. Dutch booklet as a uh, to start with, but we really wanted to make it Caribbean proof, I would say. Uh, um, so we basically we followed the uh, SWOP ID, that's the Dutch guideline. We, we also followed the uh, US guidelines, the ITSA guidelines. Uh, they have much more Marseille and MRSA infections. Marseille is nothing else than a beta lactam resistant. Uh, Stop aureus. And remember, beta lactam is the best, uh, the most efficient killer under the uh, antibiotics. Um, and uh, Colombia has more, uh, much more um, experience with uh, carbapenemase resistant uh, uh, pathogens. Uh, so we also ask our Colombian colleagues for some input, and uh, that's how we made the, the booklet. So it's not just a simple copy from. The, um, the Dutch situation, um, but we try to make it, um, yeah, like uh, for the, the regional situation. And it's, I mean, it's quite uh, successful because uh, we heard that in Curaçao, for example, they're using our antibiotic booklet uh, as well. Can I have the next one, please? Yeah, there are some challenges here also. Uh, uh, certain populations that are used to lower threshold of antibiotic use. Eh? Um, like for a uh, sore throat, for example, or any of the uh, other uh, causes of inflammation. Uh, uh, people just want to give, uh, uh, want to get antibiotics because they think everything is going better. The food rigas, uh, everybody knows them, uh, where you can get sarcosin, uh, uh, for example. And uh, well, the thing is also that uh, we have still have limited lab facilities. I mean, we have six or seven, uh, seven laboratories on the uh, island. For example, Molikov is a machine that can, as soon as you have a positive culture, within two or three hours can tell you which bacteria uh, it is. So we have to do it old fashioned way with the, the so-called PyTech, and that gives an extra delay of 24 to 48 hours. And we, because of that, we have to keep patients quite long, and uh, usually like three, four, five days on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and if we have, of course, all these new tools available, then uh, if we can reduce it uh, with some days, we can uh, start targeting the therapy uh, much uh, faster. Next slide, please. So this is our uh, antibiotic booklet, aruba.stop.id. Uh, Unfortunately, it's only in Dutch, uh, uh, and that is because it's uh, it's a uh, Dutch based website, and we requested and we backed it basically for uh, an English version as well. But actually, I think it's quite good, readable for non 
Dutch speaking people also because I mean, the names are all there and the same. Can I have the next one, please? Okay, so um, this is about the theory. Yeah? Um, now about uh, the case. A uh, lady, 25 years old. Um, well, uh, let's say this is like uh, the first uh, cystitis or urinary tract infection, bladder infection uh, in two years. Uh, no culture is done. Um, she visited uh, Dr. De Kast. And what would you choose as an antibiotic for this? Uh, she's, uh, augmented. <laughs> she's not very sick actually. So it's just some uh, complaints of like a sore back. Yeah, I need to phone to you now. So who, who chooses augmented? No one? Sarcopsin. Uh, okay, very well. Uh, nitro yeah. that's more, uh, and Cotrimoxazole, and Fosfo. Okay, well, actually, that's quite good, but you can. Yes, yes. Well, actually, this is what, what I think, and I will, um, I will tell it also what the reasons are. Many times people think that what, the wider, the better. Um, but uh, cystitis is a good example to show uh, that it's definitely not uh, not true. But we know we have data for 2017. That's the, the latest data about E. coli, uh, um, and we know that about 50% of the E. coli is nowadays augmented and susceptible, which is quite low. And um, you always try to give if you give an antibiotic, an empiric antibiotic. So empiric means that you don't have any culture yet. Uh, but it's like a, a, the best guess, the best uh, guess. Then uh, you want to be at least 80 to 90 percent uh, sure. So actually, album did fails for it. So it's way too wide. Uh, I mean, you get a lot of out selection, but it's also quite weak because it only uh, uh, attacks 50 percent uh, probably. The same actually for sarcosin. And uh, sarcosin has the uh, the added disadvantage, I would say that it's, uh, uh, nowadays people think that it's the biggest outselector for Marseille infections. There has been studies in hospitals in the US, for example, that if they stop uh, with uh, sarcopsins or, or uh, chimerones in general, the, the year after they stop, they have half of the Marseille infections than the, than the year before. And that's the reason that, for example, in States it's severely restricted and also in Colombia for example um, if my colleague infectiologists give sarcopsin in Bucaramanga or in Bogota or whatever they directly get um, uh, like an auditor they call it auditor uh, behind them even though they are infectiologists uh, who says uh, well why uh, an infectiologist is prescribing uh, Cyprusin. So, also in Colombia, this is really not done anymore. To, uh, you can only give it in, in when you have no other options. And then it's quite sad that, well, here also in Aruba, also uh, a lot of uh, doctors uh, still give Cyprusin so easily. Um, Nitroferantoin, well, the, the benefit of Nitroferantoin is that it has good coverage, right? 80% of our and it's very selective in, in urine. So basically you don't get any serum levels, but you pee it out directly. Eh? And it stays then in the, the bladder, of course, until you put the, the bladder. Um, so it's actually exactly what you uh, what you want. Uh, one side effect is uh, some nausea, that's especially if you give elderly people, uh, well, uh, Two times the 100 milligrams, the, the short acting, because then you get quite a high peak, uh, and then you get uh, some uh, some nausea, and then you cannot use it with a GFR below 20. That used to be uh, 50, but new literature says that you can safely use it until the GFR of 20. So also with quite some severe kidney insufficiency, you can you can use it. Phosphomycin, that uh, it's a very old antibiotic. It has been used uh, a long time. Then it was off the screen for. Tens of years, and now it's basically back because also phosphomycin uh, has about the same advantages as uh, nitrofurantoin. And then you have Cotrim, 
uh, which is a bit on the wide side, wide spectrum, but it still has good coverage. So I would say one of these three. This is from the Dutch NIK guidelines, but it's also in the Itza American guidelines. So the, the idea that Americans many times uh, give too wide uh, advices or so, it's not true. It's, uh, this is also just the American guidelines. So if you um, still go wider uh, or broader, I would say, than, uh, than these ones, then uh, don't use these arguments because they're incorrect in, in Holland and uh, in the US. They, these are the top three, basically. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is basically, so if you look in, the, in our booklet, Basically, you see these uh, these two advisors. We don't have uh, treatment for Pim easily on the island, uh, so we choose basically a majority of the to be all phosphomycin. And have the next one, please. Okay, another infection is uh, cellulitis. Huh? It's a huge problem on Aruba, and I think it has everything to do with uh, obesity. Um, when the, uh, of course, when people are obese, then the backflow to the heart is. Uh, blood is worse and then uh, the lymph nodes are uh, obstructed and then we see a huge amount of uh, obesity also in the hospital. Many people have recurrent infections also if you have one time cellulitis you get local tissue destruction and then it's like a vicious circle and the next time you're more at risk and usually it's stuff aureus or stuff the coxi. Next one. <coughs> well, this is the Caucasia being uh, uh, male, uh, BMI, uh, obese, uh, also recurrent cellulitis, and then redness and swelling of the right more than the left over the last six months. Now he has some progression of the redness and that you can see. Who will give antibiotics? Just, uh, he only has an increase of the redness. He doesn't have fever, he doesn't feel quite bad. Who would give antibiotics in this case? No one? few people? Okay, uh, well it's actually uh, quite difficult to uh, to uh, know when uh, this leg will get infected actually. So what we use in the hospital is what I use also, it's a, it's a CRP. Uh, the, the reason is that um, there's a lot of other causes, non-infectious causes for uh, swelling and redness of that, uh, of that leg. Um, okay, but just in this case, say that uh, we use antibiotics. And then again, uh, who will chose for a cellulitis, a recurring cellulitis, augmentin? No one? Cyproxin? Flucox? Okay. Uh, Clindamycin? Okay. And azithromycin? Okay. Okay. Yes, okay, so two clocks and clindamycin. I, I would say stick to the beta lactams and um, give uh, fluproxacity as a first choice. Again, I go through the pros and the cons. Um, one of the reasons that uh, people more and more stick to beta lactams is that there are um, signals that uh, beta lactams also enhance the innate immune system. <coughs> And as soon as you switch away from beta lactams, the outcome for many infections is different. We know that, for example, uh, if you treat a, a normally susceptible staph aureus infection uh, with vancomycin instead of fluproxacity, uh, the mortality is about twice as high, and no one really knows why. Um, but uh, the latest thoughts are that uh, we underestimated the beta lactams for a long time. The augmentin is a bit too wide and it has been given three times daily. Cypro is a bad choice for staph aureus and the reason is that uh, it's very easy for um, staph aureus to get uh, resistant to uh, cyprofloxacin. Um, and don't forget these warnings also. In the US they give a box warning for severe tendinopathy and neuropathy. Flutrox is, I would say, the right beta lactam in this case. And it rightly targets exactly, remember the scheme, rightly uh, affects uh, staph aureus and structure coxine. 
when betting from two sources that uh, that's some varying as absorption. Some people absorb about fifty percent, some people forty, some people sixty. Um, uh, clindamycin has the added advantage that it also targets Marse, but it's a bit too broad, and uh, it's associated with Clostridium infections, so it looks much less. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that clindamycin use is also being restricted in the States. Uh, in the States, of course, they have a lot of C. diff infection. We don't see that many here, actually, in the world. And azadromycin is, uh, I would say, also not the first uh, is a very slight increase of sudden that we get and uh, side effects. We have the next one, please. So this is actually actually what we made. We, our uh, idea would be to start with Crucox. You don't. Yeah, you don't cover a Marseille with uh, with Crucox, but because um, in the community the prevalence of Marseille is is a few percent, I would say. So you are, uh, you can always start with Flucox and as soon as you don't see any improvement after a few days, you have to wait with Celeritis a few days. It's not like a urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infection, if you give antibiotic, antibiotic usually on day two or three, it gets better. But with Celeritis, it can take three, four, five days <coughs> until you start to see an improvement. Um, and this is for the hospital. So, okay, this is the nice thing from the book. This is for basically for the uh, Dr. Picasso, and this is for the hospital, and you see that we choose to give uh, Flucox uh, IV in a continuous perfusion. Uh, many latest guidelines uh, suggest that. We give uh, Cefazolin in a uh, non-severe beta lactam allergy, and we give Dinamycin if we think of a Marcy infection or a severe beta lactam allergy and fungal if there's a sepsis associated with the cellulitis. Well, this is almost impossible to see, but uh, this uh, just gives you a few uh, uh, differential diagnosis from a, uh, a red and a swollen uh, leg. And especially when both legs are swollen, don't think of an infectious cause. It's very unlikely, I mean, the statistical chance is very low that um, you uh, you have cellulitis in that case, uh, but you rather think of uh, stasis dermatitis, for example, contact uh, dermatitis. Um, this is hypostatic dermatitis. That, that's actually the most likely differential diagnosis. So what we do sometimes is do a CRP, and if the CRP is low, then and it's most likely uh, a non-infectious cause of an inflamed um, uh, soft tissue. Remember the six causes of inflammation, not only infection. Okay, can I have the next one? Okay, and this is a problem that we see a lot here. Eh? We come in cellulitis, uh, obese people that get it like uh, once, twice, three times a year. Um, I have a feeling myself that in the past it was not taken too seriously uh, uh, on the island and they just, uh, it went well for a few months and then they came to the hospital again, they were admitted to the hospital again for one or two weeks and then they were sent out and no, nobody really thought of prophylaxis because uh, there is actually some literature about it. I mean, of course, uh, a very important advice is losing weight, but that's uh, well, quite uh, difficult for a lot of people, I would say. Um, stockings, there are some uh, uh, elastic stockings, uh, there's uh, uh, some, some evidence for that, that it reduces recurrence, but this is also a very uh, uh, important one. Uh, if many people that get uh, one tablet of Proxil daily, I remember if you give like a small spectrum antibiotic, uh, there, uh, the, the, the chance of out selection is quite low. Eh? So uh, amoxicillin, 500 milligrams, or a uh, Cotrim, 480 once, once a day, for example, for Trimoxazole. Uh, that gives about a reduction of 50% of the uh, uh, amount of cellulitis. And uh, Pinidol, again, also gives about the same uh, results. So think about it, and I mean, you can do it yourself as Dr. Gas, but you can also refer those people to our office, and then we will discuss it with the patient uh, as well. Okay. Um, oh yes, uh, sepsis. Um, 
I told you already that uh, the damage to the body is uh, many times mostly because of the dysregulated immune response than the initial bacterial attack itself. And that is being recognized by the new sepsis definition. And this, so uh, sepsis is a life-threatening organism function caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Remember the pneumococcus? Pneumococcus is dead within 24 hours, but the sepsis rages on for three, four, five days, for seven days, people are sick, sick, sick. Now my question to you is, who can diagnose sepsis? Uh, because together with new definition, actually things have been simplified. I mean, in the past, we had, uh, you needed to have the, the SIRS criteria, you know, you needed to have the leukocytes above 12 or below four, uh, and all these things you need to have left. But actually, the thing is we can go, uh, because of time, we can go a bit uh, through it, maybe you can uh, click through. The thing is that, uh, yes, that's correct, that's correct. Any healthcare uh, professional with a blood pressure machine and a, and a watch or smart, smartphone can nowadays uh, diagnose sepsis, also nurses on the ER. <coughs> nurses on the HOH are also expected uh, to help in diagnosis because you need to know it as soon as possible. Can I have the next one, please? So it's it's very simple nowadays. Uh, they, they took out all, all the lab, actually, because with lab you have to wait one or two hours or I don't know, here maybe longer even. Uh, in the how hard sometimes you have to wait two or three hours. But sepsis is nothing else than uh, two of these three points with signs of infection. So if someone comes with a, uh, like the cellulitis again, and he has at least two of these three points, <coughs> we call it sepsis. We, the reason why we do it is that we don't want to miss sepsis. It's not, it's not uh, uh, very bad to give a patient septic zone uh, and then the next day he uh, doesn't really have a sepsis, you know? I mean, that doesn't matter too much, you know? Uh, but the thing is, you don't want to miss sepsis because we know with a severe sepsis, uh, um, every hour you wait more for antibiotics gives uh, an extra mortality of about six to seven percent. So you have to, as soon as possible, if someone comes in in the EMSAM with a cellulitis and he has at least two of these three points, please give him antibiotics. First, take some blood culture. You have blood culture bottles here, right? So, yeah. yeah, so uh, take blood culture uh, bottles and then directly uh, start with uh, uh, the septic zone. It's very easy. And the thing is that this is big data medicine, I call it. Um, they checked for like 100,000 patients on the ER and they checked which, uh, uh, which signs are actually most suggestive of a severe uh, infection. And the funny thing is, I mean, you can make a, uh, like a graph here, but if people have uh, zero points, the, uh, the chance is, uh, the, the, like the 28 day mortality, it's like 2% uh, or so. If people have uh, one point, it's 5%. If people have two points, it's, it goes up very high. It's like uh, 15%, and if three points, it's like 40% or so. You know, these, uh, these graphs you have. So if you have signs of infections and all three points that you have severe sepsis, I would say. And the mortality from sepsis is higher than a myocardial infarction. And the funny thing is that if someone comes in also here, but also in our uh, emergency uh, uh, room, and if you make an ECG, you see an infarction, all the doctors, all the nurses, they are like, well, this is an infarction, we have to do something about it. But with sepsis, well, uh, a person just lays there and uh, he has some fever or not, and he's a bit, drowsy uh, or whatever, you know. Uh, the people think that you can wait, but you cannot wait with, uh, with sepsis. So it's a very easy definition. Yeah? Uh, but if people have at least these two points, then start with the therapy. Take cultures, give broad spectrum antibiotics, and that is septic zone to uh, <coughs> And uh, start with fluid, because also nowadays, we know that in the first three hours, on average, you have to give 30 milligrams per kilo, and that's about uh, two and a half liters or three liters of fluid right away. 
Okay, so on a busy evening at EMSA, I guess the ER it can be extremely busy, like in the age of aging as well. 54 years old male, uh, obese, diabetes, a heart problem, and you don't know that much else about it. You can disarray, you can calculate the Q so far. Uh, so you check blood pressure, the breathing frequency, and uh, it is more drowsy than usual. And if two or three points, uh, you call it sepsis, and you treat it accordingly. And you want to treat one sepsis too much that in the end is not a sepsis, then that you miss a sepsis, and you don't give antibiotics, and you give these 6% extra mortality. And this is the only thing that basically you have to uh, uh, Remember, so it's give septic salt, give uh, uh, fluids, uh, that's, uh, you have to give quite uh, aggressively, and uh, send the patient to the AHA already with the fluid and with the, the bottles also. Okay, uh, yeah, what we choose, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, hospitals choose <coughs> septic salt, uh, I, I show you why it gives you uh, structured focus. And stuff always coverage, but it also gives a uh, gram negative. Uh, but uh, it's up for discussion. Um, I'll show you uh, later the uh, the swab, uh, the, the antibiotic booklet uh, guideline. It's easy to give, um, but hardly any contraindication. Not many people are allergic, and most pathogens remain susceptible, except for a certain cases. Maybe you can show it on the next uh, slide, please. So this is actually our advice. And if you have risk factors for ESBL uh, carriers, that are the multi-resistant gram negatives, you give it, uh, you combine it with uh, tantamycin. And if you have a proven ESBL infection, you already start meropenem. Do you have meropenem here in the team cell? No. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you have a, a, a Proven Marseille colonization, basically you give uh, septic sauna and vancomycin. And uh, well, here you see again the, uh, uh, well, the explanation. And here you can uh, also play combinations with your sepsis, uh, central line sepsis, central catheter, neutrophilic sepsis. You have all these things that are just one of these days. If you have a quiet time and on your computer, just uh, check it, please. Okay, there's a few medical myths I want to uh, discuss with you. Some are quite innocent and some not, I would say. Um, blood can only be drawn in present states. I don't know how it is here, but in the HOIH, for example, uh, in the early morning at seven, it's extremely busy in the laboratory. And then uh, in the afternoon at three o'clock, you can, uh, yeah, we call it in Dutch, uh, shoot a cannon. Then uh, no one is there because everybody basically <laughs> says that uh, you can only take uh, uh, blood in uh, a fasting state. But actually, the thing is that it doesn't matter for, uh, for almost anything, only for the glucose itself, for example. But basically, the diabetes doctors, they love much more the A1C, which is the average glucose in the last two months. And that is not being uh, changed by uh, eating yes or no. Cholesterol, there has been uh, guidelines two years ago from the <coughs> uh, European Cardiology so uh, Society and the American Society that it doesn't really matter, only the triglycerides. The only thing, but for